this morning, chapter 6, verses 3 to 15, is the uh, passage of scripture that I've selected for the Led by the Spirit series uh, in the summer. It's, it's our fourth message, and it's called The Lips of the Spirit. And so let's read this passage of scripture together um, uh, responsively, and uh, we'll start from verse 3 all the way to 15. So this is the Word of God. Chapter 6 of verse, verse 3 of chapter 6 of Acts. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirits and of wisdom, whom we, uh, we will appoint to this duty. Put ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they uh, chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorius, and Nicanor, and Timon, and uh, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a uh, proselyte of Antioch. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests came, became obedient to the faith. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the free men, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. And let's read together. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Amen. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news lately, and uh, you know um, it's interesting how things develop these days. And uh, it's a season of um, debates, right? We see the democratic democra um, democratic uh, candidates for the presidential election next year, and I don't know how many, like twenty something, so many of them. And uh, I did not know the country had so many problems, and they talked about many, many problems of of the country, right? They talked about uh, border, you know, control southern border. They talk about um, health care reform. Uh, they talk about uh, the national debt and national security and all these issues. And uh, if, in fact, there will be 20 different views of how to tackle all these main issues. But throughout the debate, you know, I saw just clips of it. Uh, I would say nobody would argue the fact, this one fact. Everybody could ag agree with, on this fact that the country has problems. Many, many problems, in fact. And the reason for these debates, for these discussions, is beca because of the desire of the people to have someone take care to solve these problems that are, um, that are piling up almost every day. And not only, we don't have to just look at our, the national debates and uh, the, con uh, the conversations there to find problems in our lives. Uh, the problems are in our households, in our families, within ourselves too. There's a lot of conflict and a lot of brokenness inside. And not only uh, is um, the, the country broken, but nature is broken. There's climate change and all these different ways suggestions how to tackle all these issues. But was it always, the world we live in, was it always so broken? We know from scripture that God created not a broken world, but a perfect world, a beautiful world, a paradise. And uh, he put man and woman there to, to thrive and to live and to reproduce. But what happened? Sin came in this world, the evil spirit uh, puts a virus, so to speak, in humanity's heart 
to claim for, their, for themselves uh, what is not theirs. They wanted to be like God, just like the evil spirit wanted to be like God. And because of this, this uh, spirit of, of darkness, of, of sin, there is conflict with, between people. Everybody wants to be their own God. Everybody wants to be the boss, so of course there's conflict. And instead of managing nature, even nature has been conquered and abused uh, because people want it to be like God. And so there's conflict, there's problems, and there are no resolutions, it, thinks, it seems like. And we're looking for that, that leader, a strong leader who could solve our problems and live a wonderful life. The Bible suggests, no, not suggests, it gives us a very different community in the first century as we've been looking at. It's not a spirit of, of darkness and of evil, but it is the Holy Spirit who came upon these people who are Christ followers, and the Holy Spirit starts to build this beautiful community. People are supposed to be selfish, right? But this community was selfless. They were giving, selling their goods to meet, meet the needs of the lesser folks of the community. And uh, they were supposed to be, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, to find justice. You know, when someone does them wrong, they have to find justice and retribution and punish them. But this community started to forgive and to love. How is this possible? The Holy Spirit was there, and He was the one creating this beautiful community of God. This was the community that was being restored to the original plans of God. As we look into this, these scripture passages, this, these stories, we can find what the Holy Spirit gives Christians so that we could participate in the work of the Holy Spirit to restore, to solve, and to um, change the situations in, not only in our church, but in our lives, but also in the community at large. The Holy Spirit has given us some tools, as He did in the first century, of, of bringing about change and solution into the world, into a broken, devastated world. Today's message on the Holy Spirit is about what is given to us as Christians by the Holy Spirit to solve these problems in our lives of sin. What has the Holy Spirit already given to us? Holy Spirit who dwells in every one of you. What has He given you? The two things He has given you, given us, for us to live as the conquerors that we're meant to live in the kingdom of God. The first is this. The Holy Spirit has given us wisdom. He has, the Holy Spirit has given us wisdom. He is the Spirit of wisdom. Can we say it together as well? The Holy Spirit gave them wisdom. As the Holy Spirit was full, full in this community, this community was growing, right? And we read from the scripture that this became a mega group, a big group. 3,000 people were added by the day. 5,000 people were added by the day. And when a lot of people gather, it means there's trouble. And in fact, unintentionally, I believe, uh, one of the great ministries of the church is, uh, was uh, compassion ministry, uh, it goes giving to the widows in the community. And unintentionally, because the leaders, the overseers were mostly Hebraic Jews, they were Jews who, were, who lived in the Palestine area and they uh, spoke Aramean, some spoke Hebrew. Because of that, they unintentionally uh, gave more benefit to the Hebraic Jews, I mean Hebraic um, widows. And so this big church, which is also made up of Hellenistic Jews who are Christians, people who are more comfortable with speaking Greek and Latin uh, and Roman culture than the uh, Palestine culture, they had complained. What about our people? You know, our widows are being marginalized. You know, it's not fair. And they start to grumble. If you look at verse 1 of chapter 6, uh, I don't think we have it on the screen. It says, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenistics, Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because of the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. This word, complaint, it means it's the word grumbling, you know, back talking, you know, they're mumbling and, and uh, grumbling and complaining in the community. 
and this became such a big problem. You might think, oh, so a couple of people are just, you know, have some regrets and, and bitterness towards the community. But if you think about it, this is a community of like 5,000 people plus. It's a big church, and there's these groups of people that can be identified, and certain group is not getting the benefit, and they all identify that, you know, we are being mistreated. It's not fair. So this was a very difficult and dangerous situation for this early community of God. This beautiful community of the Holy Spirit was building up. When the world has problems, it seeks experts, right? When uh, we have a plumbing problem, we call the plumber. We have an electrical problem, we call an electrician. Right? If we have a financial difficulty in our banks or our church, we call a financial advisor, we think. And, uh, but if there is a conflict in the church, who do you call? Do you, is there a, a counselor for the church? Who is that? When we are trying to fix something that's, that's tangible, like piano or um, you know, finances, something that's man-made, we bring in somebody who is knowledgeable in that subject, who has experience in that field. But if it's really internal, the hearts of people, the sinful nature of man, you know, uh, I want to be, I want to be treated fairly, and there's conflict and there's misunderstanding. There is no expert. What they needed was not knowledge or experience. They needed wisdom. And so, what does the church do? The apostles, the twelve apostles, they talk to all the disciples, the, all the leaders of the church, gather them together and say, select seven from you who are filled with the Spirit and with wisdom. In verse 3, brothers, pick, up, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of spirits and of wisdom. Yes, indeed, they needed this wisdom. What is wisdom? We uh, actually talked about this in the spring, uh, the series, uh, the Kingdom Established series. When we looked at Solomon, right? So Solomon, who was king of wisdom. What is wisdom? What is the character of wisdom? It's not just a skill set. It is just not a pithy motto or a smart something, you know, a brilliant statement that you, you know, uh, let out. Uh, it is a characteristic of godly wisdom is that it saves lives. It doesn't, doesn't benefit one party. It benefits everyone. It saves lives. It is a third option. It is not uh, option A or B. What are you? Which one do you choose? It's another option. An option that saves lives. And this early church was seeking people who could come up with this spiritual wise solution to bring life. To bring joy and Again, prosperity into this beautiful community of God. They needed this wisdom. And the person who gives them this wisdom. Wisdom that is beyond any humanly crafted um, you know, knowledge is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit as he forms his community, as he uh, mends and fixes his broken community, he gives the people of God spirit wisdom. Uh, you know, one of the pastors I really have great respect is uh, Charles Swindoll. Chuck Swindoll. And uh, he was the sem uh, president of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary where, where I uh, enrolled in. And after he retired from, uh, he quit from his uh, seminary president position, he planted a church uh, in the area. And, you know, he's famous. He has radio ministry. He wrote many, many biblical books with his legacy. So after he retired, he plants a church. And after one year of his this church planting, this church is like 2,000 members. Mega church, right? Uh, it's still growing even today. But uh, in his early stages of this church, he shares with us an episode, a something that happened in his church. So he was preaching one Sunday about the importance of Christians abiding by the law, having good moral character, and being responsible citizens of this world uh, to be salt and light to you know, the community. And he was saying, we must abide by the traffic laws, never run a red light. So he really hammered this point that Sunday. And after he was done with his Sunday response, he was going home, and uh, he made a big mistake. He ran a red light. And at that moment, he was just so, so he missed it. He couldn't, uh, he missed the light. And so he 
he didn't get in an accident, but he ran the light, and at the moment, he felt a lot of stares because it was in front of his church. So he looked around, and sure enough, people were watching Pastor Swindoll after he preached about, about abiding by the law. Sure enough, next day, he got a phone call from one of his members. Pastor Swindoll, can we meet? We'd like to meet with you. It's not I'd like to meet. We'd like to meet with you. And so... Pastor Swindoll was very guilty. And uh, so to soften the situation, although he didn't know what they were going to talk about, he kind of knew, he said, let's meet at this restaurant. And uh, sure, I'll meet with you. But uh, before he went, he had, uh, wrote something on a cardboard, he said, and put it on his neck as he entered into the restaurant. He says, I am a sinner. <laughs> And when people saw that, they were just laughing and, and clapping and uh, just having a good time. And the people were witty enough to write another sign on another cardboard saying, those who are with this without sin, throw the first stone. <laughs> and so uh, it's a, a happy episode. What could have been a tense situation, I guess, you know, an awkward situation, uh, uh, Dr. Swindoll, he had wisdom to godly wisdom to uh, uh, deal with that situation. And the people of God also responded in kind. Yes, the Holy Spirit gives us godly wisdom that saves lives. That's what happened exactly in the first century church. As the Jerusalem church, there was this divide and there was this problem that needed to be solved. It could have escalated and it could have been a church division and the gospel message would, would be weakened. What did they do? They selected seven people and we have the names of those people who were selected as a task force to solve this problem. We don't know how they solved it, but they selected seven people to do this, administer the distribution more fairly. But that's kind of assumed. But what's apparent in the scripture is, I want you to look at these names again and tell me if you find any Old Testament Hebraic names, right? Although you're not an expert, I'm not an expert in the no, first, century, first century culture. Just look at these names and tell me if you find a Hebraic name like David or Jonathan or, or, or um, all, the, all these uh, other uh, people of God in the, in the Old Testament. If you look with me, again in verse uh, 5 it says, uh, and uh, they chose Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, Parmenas and Nicolau, Nicholas. All these names were foreign names to a Hebraic culture people. It was, in fact, Greek names. They were, in fact, Roman names. They were people who were fluent in Greek, more so than uh, Aramaic or Hebrew. We can see the wisdom in that. We can see that the 12, the 12 apostles were Hebraic Jews. They were more comfortable. They were living in Palestine. But they intentionally chose the seven leaders, the first elected officials of the church. They elected them from the uh, Greek-speaking culture and brought this harmony and this uh, resolution that they needed so much. When the Holy Spirit works, He gives us wisdom, a third solution that brings life to the community of God. And what's the result? In fact, life began to spring up again in verse 7. It says, And the word of God continued to increase. Number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Not only was it maintained status quo, but it grew. And uh, it says that great many of the priests came, became obedient to the word of God, to the gospel. Can you imagine a Jewish Israeli today in East Palestine? becoming a Christian, they don't like Christians. They have nothing to do with Christianity. But great many priests, they were convinced that, wow, this community is different. They have this love and unity that is not found anywhere in this world. Hebrews and Greeks coming together, worshiping, sharing, and giving distribution of the, for the, the widows. They see that and they saw the hand of God and God's favor was upon this community. That's what the wisdom of God does. To be more specific, we read from Paul's scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 of what the Holy Spirit 
does, who he is. Let's read this verse together. It's on the screen for us. Ready, go. But as it, it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The last phrase, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. What the Spirit can give us is not what we've experienced, see, or hear, or we've experienced in the past. It's something from the very heart of God. But the very depths of God, a third option that could save lives. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That is the tool, that is the gift that a Spirit-filled person receives as he or she is led by the Spirit of God. We could probably apply and uh, ask God for this wisdom in many areas of our lives, right? We need this wisdom, Holy Spirit wisdom, in our relationship with other people. We need this wisdom uh, to solve this project that we have given, given at work. Or we, have, we need this wisdom to, to um, guide our kids uh, in their educational path, how to select college and in their career. We need wisdom, godly wisdom, to do all these things. But this morning, I'd like to suggest one specific kind of wisdom that we must seek. Maybe this wisdom, when we seek this wisdom, it encompasses all the wisdom that we need for each day. And that is, we need to ask God for the wisdom to understand the Word of God. God has given us 66 books of the Bible for every circumstance of our lives. Every situation, all the sin problems, the brokenness in our lives, all those things can be solved as the Holy Spirit illuminates uh, uh, to us what He is talking about this morning, that particular morning, as you read His Word. So I implore you to ask the Spirit who gives us wisdom, the wisdom to understand what His Word is saying to me today. As we have this wisdom, we can have tremendous application, many applications in our day, and hear from the Spirit Himself how we are to live about and solve the difficult problems in our lives. Some of us have been uh, sharing our quiet time this week. Um, I know you have. Uh, and uh, been uh, doing a quiet time uh, series and seminars, and then we've been applying it in our small group. And in my group, I've been, I, we did it met for the first time yesterday. And uh, the depth of application is just amazing. We look at the same scripture, but we hear God speaking to individual situations and giving us what knowledge and wisdom of what to do, how to handle these situations. It is just amazing. If we know and we are confident what the Spirit of God is telling us today, specifically through His Scripture. As we understand, if, as, if we have that wisdom, understanding His Word, our lives could live a heavenly life, a life that is beyond human understanding and comprehension. And this applies to all areas of our lives. And as we ask, seek that wisdom, the Holy Spirit says He will not hold back but he will give us lavishly to understand his word and his will for our lives. So brothers and sisters, I pray that uh, as people who have the Spirit of God indwelling in your lives, that you would seek after each morning, not just the casual reading of scripture and you know, casual quiet time, but this week, my challenge for you is, as you do at least twice quiet time in your, in your daily routine uh, throughout, the, throughout the week, why don't you ask God, God, Holy Spirit, would you give me the wisdom to understand this morning what you are saying, what one message that you have for me. And this wisdom will become the seed for all wisdom for your life that day. The Holy Spirit gave the first church wisdom of God to save lives. Secondly, the Holy Spirit gave them, gave them bold lips. Let's, can, can we say this together as well? The Holy Spirit gave them bold lips. In the second part of our story, the story focuses on one person in particular that uh, the community of God elected as a leader. And that's the first name that's found in the list of seven people, and his name is Stephen. Verse 8, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was 
doing great wonders and signs among the people. Not only does the Spirit give grace, I mean um, uh, wisdom, but he gave uh, uh, Stephen the, the lips of boldness to proclaim God's truth. Uh, it seems that Stephen was probably, we can conjecture and guess, educational, educated guess, that he spoke fluent Greek. His name was a Greek name, but he also was able to, to uh, um, discuss and converse and dispute with the uh, Hellenistic people in verse 9. We see all these names, uh, four names. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the free men of Cyrenians, Cyrenians and of Alexandrians, Sicilia and Asia, all these regions came to argue with Stephen because he was talking about Jesus' resurrection. He was talking about how Jesus is the way and the life and the truth that we could know God. He is the only way for salvation. And they didn't like that. So they started to argue with them. But, you know, God gave Stephen the lips of the Holy Spirit and no one could refute. No one could argue against what Stephen was saying to the effect that they became so desperate they, they hired false witnesses. This is a crime, right? False witnesses to, to say that Stephen says all sorts of such things that are not, not, not true. But they want to accuse uh, Stephen of wrongdoing and, and punish him. And so if someone was lying in court against you, you did not say this, but they twisted your words and it, they're trying to picture you as this bad, false person. Your face would be stern and angry and, and bitter. And that's what you expect of Stephen, right? But what was his face like? As we read in verse uh, 15, his face was not angry. He was not ferocious. But it says his, angel, his face was like that, the face of an angel. So peaceful, so confident, so bold. There is something about him that we do not know. In fact, so he continues on this long sermon into chapter 7 uh, to four, f verse 52 and 3. This, this is the longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts, by the way. And uh, he, he uh, actually rebukes the people of how the people of Israelites, Israel have continuously rejected God, have continuously rejected what God has said to them, the prophets, and even Jesus Christ, who has resurrected and is apparently the Son of God. And he criticized them and rebuked them. And it was a very confident speech. And he concludes with this in verse 53 of uh, chapter 7. Do we have it on the screen? Uh, you who received the uh, law as delivered by the angels and did not keep it. You know, God sent you messengers. God sent you prophets of old. But you still rejected it. And what's the res response of this? And it says the people, the Jews, could not stand, could not refute against the truth of, of Stephen that he was preaching from the Old Testament, the history, the track record of their uh, rebellion against God. They had no way to go against what uh, Stephen was saying. And uh, Stephen, when he looked up, he saw the heavens open and he saw God and Jesus standing on the right side of God. And he also talked about this to the people and this enraged the people even more. And so when the people realized, the Jews realized that they could not win him over, win over uh, according to logic or to reason, they could not refute against Stephen, what did they do? They plugged their ears and they would start screaming so not to hear what Stephen had to say and they used violence. They took him out of the city and stoned him to death. And the last part of uh, chapter 7, it says that uh, in ver chapter 7 verse, the last verse, it says, And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And he, when he had said this, he fell asleep. We see that Jesus took care of him. Uh, he took him to heaven and he fell asleep. And he uh, dismissed his life on this earth. When, this, when the Spirit was filled in Stephen's heart and his, uh, his life, God gave him, the Spirit gave him a, uh, a, a tongue, a, a speech that is unreputable. 
It's, uh, it's uh, an undeniable, a speech that is so powerful and confident that no one could go against what uh, Stephen was saying. Isn't it strange that even though when we hear a uh, good logic and everything makes sense and we can confirm it's true, our response should be like the response of Peter's audience in chapter 2 saying, Peter, what shall we do? We have committed this murder of killing our Lord Jesus Christ, who is Son of God. That should have been the response by these Jews. They plugged their ears. They were shouting so they would hear no more. And they stoned Stephen to death to get rid of the messenger. You know, the funny thing is, we still have people like that today. Maybe it's not that funny. Maybe it's sad. That uh, people are not really reasonable. It's not based upon their reason and rationales that, you know, they make this decision and they choose not Christianity, but they just unconditionally hate Christians. They unconditionally reject the message. Aren't there people around you, maybe your uh, co-worker, people or like around in your neighborhood, or maybe even your immediate family members, you approach them. Maybe you've prayed a lot for many weeks or months, and you ask God for boldness of your lips, and you start talking about the most important thing in your life, about Jesus, about eternal life, about church. And the minute you mention the word Jesus, the min minute you mention the word church, they said, stop right there. I don't want to hear. Let's not have this discussion. They don't even give you a chance. For some reason, they are stone-hearted. They cannot be reasoned with. This is more emotional than uh, rational. And uh, there is this hatred against church. When we find this, it really breaks our heart and saddens our heart. It is just the same heart as the Jews had against Stephen. This heart of plugging their ears and shouting out there with their voices and say, we don't want to hear you, we want to stone you to death. We find that same stone-cold heart in people around us. When this happens to you in your life, what is your response? Do you say, I will never talk about Jesus in my workplace. I am heartbroken. I am discouraged. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you afraid of the complaints that you will hear from your peers that you talk about Jesus so much? Believe it, brothers and sisters, when we do what the Holy Spirit loves, which is talking about Jesus Christ, which is preaching Jesus Christ. He will give us the boldness and boldness in our lips to do God, God's kingdom work. You know, as many of you know, we had this hot dog in the park event yesterday. Uh, it was just fun, a lot of fun. And uh, uh, usually a couple of us go out, adults go out and share the gospel every Saturday of each month. But uh, this time, there were a lot more people. <laughs> and uh, you know, some people came to grill the hot dogs, and uh, especially I was really blessed by the three youth kids who were there. Um, they had the survey in their hands to talk about Jesus, uh, and uh, they were a little bit scared. But just their presence there, and just that their, their willingness and, and love for God to want to do something for Him because of their love, uh, it meant a lot. And I felt the Holy Spirit had worked in their lives. It was a great time together. I, in particularly, I um, went out to share the good news with another brother. And uh, I did not realize we had a third member in our small team. Uh, and I realized that this uh, member was a five-year-old boy. <laughs> he was the son of my brother here. And uh, so we made a plan, a strategic plan plan of attack, <laughs> or, or, or blessing, <laughs> rather. Uh, and I said to the five-year-old boy, actually the five-year-old boy asked me, so Pastor Joseph, he had a husky voice, right? Pastor Joseph, are we going to go share the gospel today? And so, yeah, we are. <laughs> Do you know what that means? <laughs> anyway, we went, and I, I, I gave him a task, a mission. You know, whoever I greet today, whoever, you know, we talk about Jesus too, I want you to give, the, give these gospel tracts to that person as we speak. And uh, this guy was, was a beast. He was ferocious. He was like 
so active. You know, I was just saying hi, and the, already the person has the tract in their hand. So well, I was like, I was so impressed. And uh, after a short time, all the tract was gone, and we just had to come back because we had no more. And so I asked the little boy, you know, how were you so brave to give out these tracts? And he said, I don't know. Something just came up from me and I had this courage to, to give that. I, I looked at him and I told him, you know, the Holy Spirit gives us boldness to do things that we normally don't do when we do God's work. And uh, I just had so much compassion for that boy. I had to hug him. I had to, you know, um, just congratulate him and, and uh, encourage him. And so I put my hand on his head and, and prayed a blessing for him that he would be, grow up as a, a man of God, continue to love the Lord and being a good witness, a great impact for the next generation. You know, um, where did this kid get the courage? Of course, like I said, the Holy Spirit gives him the courage, but a apart from that, Another factor for this guy was that his dad was behind him, right? And his pastor, <laughs> who assigned the mission to him, was behind him. He didn't care. They'll take care of it. He just gave out the tracks. You know, that's exactly what happened to Stephen. As Stephen was proclaiming Jesus with bold lips, he saw Jesus, not only at the, sitting at the right hand of God, but standing, cheering him up. I see you, Stephen. You are my guy. You are doing my work. I'll give you boldness. I'll take care of you. And take care of him, Jesus did. He put him to sleep and he was entered into heaven. Brothers and sisters, do you want to live a confident life? Knowing your, secure, your eternity is secure. Not only knowing your eternity is secure, but filling and having the power of the Holy Spirit, which is today the wisdom and the tongue of confidence. Well, do you want that in your lives? So as you live you each day, people will notice there's something different about you, Miss So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so. You have this inner confidence that uh, I don't understand. Let that confidence, let that Holy Spirit wisdom be shown in our lives. Isn't that our prayer for us, for ourselves? We want to have that kind of life each day. In a time when we live in a very uncertain future, we don't know what tomorrow holds, what will happen tomorrow. Instead of being crafted by, uh, by other people's plans and other people's agenda and schedule, don't we want, don't you and I want a concrete goal, a concrete uh, message that we live by? As we see our Lord Jesus Christ, who, is, who was alive first century and who is still alive who is still the Lord and he's watching over us. As we focus our attention on him, not the people, what they're saying, all these solutions and persecution and, and conflicts, but when we focus on what Christ is saying to me and we have the inner confidence, our boldness does not come from pretense, just you know, having a good posture and, and uh, eloquence, that's not where we get our confidence, it comes from inside as you meet your Lord Jesus Christ and hears his voice confirming your life each day. And as Holy Spirit gives you the heavenly wisdom, the third kind of life-giving, life-changing wisdom, and you live by that, and you, you experience the presence of Lord Jesus Christ each day, we can change lives. We're not moved, swayed here and there by the culture and the spirit of the world. But we're be able to, like, like, so, like, like Stephen, we're able to live a life that is impactful. You might think Stephen's life was, oh, he just was preaching and it was, you know, so emotional and he died. No. Because of his preaching, we find the next verse that one person was deeply impacted. And his name was Saul, whose name was changed to Paul. And this very event was the fact to him, it became confirmation to him later in Paul's life that Jesus Christ is present in the witness's life. And so Paul confesses in his letter in, um, um, in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 38. He says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor r rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because Saul witnessed this 
power of the Holy Spirit in Stephen. He witnessed how, how peaceful Stephen was, how he was confident in his life and in his death. He can write this. I am confident that nothing on heaven and earth, even death itself, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. What a great impact Stephen had upon Paul and Paul has upon us. All that is possible when we have this inner confidence that comes from Christ. The wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit and the speech, the confident speech that comes from the Holy Spirit. So again, my application is simple. Focus, fix your eyes on Christ. Jesus, I want to see you every day in your scripture, in every the situations, so that I will not be swayed by the circumstance and situation of the world. The, the world has option A, B, C, and D, but God, I want a Holy Spirit option. And we can have the confident life as we focus on Jesus Christ, who is cheering us on to live the life of the witness, to live the life of the son or daughter of God. So I encourage you to live this life. Amen. Let's pray.